I've got my timekeeper going here as well, just so I, I don't uh, ruin your morning tea and, uh, and coffee that I'm sure everyone's uh, wanting to get into. Um, firstly, I just wanted to say thank you to um, Nerissa to, to, and um, to Mark for having me along here today. Um, when we did catch up, was that five, six weeks ago, um, or, um, and have a, to have a chat, um, I probably had verbal diarrhoea around because um, I was just incredibly excited that people were coming to, wanting to speak to me about um, this, this area and around how we can build capability and, and build employability um, into the academic pathway. So um, it's, it's sort of exactly what I'm, I, I, I love to talk about. Um, I've deliberately not done slides today because I want to have this quite conversational. Um, so what I've been planning, to, what I plan to do is to sort of talk for maybe uh, 10, 15 minutes, just share some insights uh, and some perspectives, um, and then I want to sort of open it up to the floor um, and hear uh, and be challenged on different things. I'm more than happy for that um, because I sit in a in, in a very different um, space, but I am very um, open and understanding to the area that you, that you're working in. So um, please just. Hand up, yell out, um, anything. Don't don't feel like you can't um, you know, put a perspective across or um, that you want to sort of ask um, me on. So who am I and what what am I doing here? Um, I've been in the youth careers and employment space for probably just under ten years now. Uh, it was quite scary when I was um, writing some notes on the plane when I was counting on my hand when I started this, and then I got to the end of the other hand, and it was heck. I, I am getting a bit older, um, but it's been something I've been. I, that I've been very passionate about from a, from a young age, and it's not something just from an um, employment point of view for me, but it's also about in my wider life that I'm a, I've been very involved in. So I started out uh, on, a, on, a, on a farm in the, in the Waikato. Um, I went to a, a, a state public school, and then I went off to Victoria University and did my Bachelor of, of Law and Bachelor of Accountancy down there. And then when I finished up down there, um, I went through and did some professional training, so I did my CA and did, um, got him into the bar. Um, from a, it's my, it's my only academic career to date, I say so far, because who knows, I, there is a chance I'll come back and do some more. But from an employment perspective alongside that, um, my employment career started off as an underage employee um, at my parents' um, farm. Um, <laughs> and um, what now they probably even fed of slave labour uh, out there. <laughs> Um, feeding out um, to stock, and then also we had an orchard, so we ran the orchard shop. So from a very young age, I was I was out there talking with people, working with people, and what I didn't quite realise back then was um, that how that actually has shaped my um, career to date, and will continue to shape it. From there, I uh, we became a petroleum transfer technician, as I refer to it, um, at um, the high school, and then while at university, I did a variety of. Um, uh, customer service jobs, basically, from bars to um, to cafes to uh, working in clothing retail outlets. Then in my university holidays, I always worked as well. So I'd go back to the farm, not so much work, we'd sold the farm by then, and then I did a whole host of things, from drain laying to roofing to all those other bit, um, things that had absolutely nothing related to my degree base. And at the time, I thought that was a bit strange, um, looking back at it when I was preparing for this. But actually, again, all of those different things um, shaped um, my employability um, and um, capability for uh, my chosen pathway. My first um, and only real job I've ever had um, that was associated to what I've, what I've done academically was I worked at PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC. So I joined them after university in their corporate tax practice and um, worked for them for nearly four years. And that was the first time that I'd actually done something that was connected to what I'd just spent five years at university studying and um, my passion uh, when I was at school as well. Um, and then when I finished up at um, PwC, I did something, I don't know, is it the coffee run order? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry guys, I'm busy. <laughs> um, so, then from there, I, we set up a business, um, a social enterprise, helping young kids think about career, uh, career pathways. And um, probably born out of my own feeling from coming from a rural area and not realising what the different opportunities I had out there when I um, left university. Um, you know, I had no idea I could go, have gone to, into a bank, into an accounting and finance role. I had no idea I could go into a Fonterra when we were, we were farmers. I had no understanding of that. 
And I think um, what I also didn't realise then is that that pathway I'd gone through and joined PwC because that's what I thought I should be doing and that's what everybody else uh, was doing. And they had the best presentations back then on campus and they'd take us out and um, which those things are probably changing now um, around um, you know socialising and then we go wow we want to work this is this is great I can travel the world um, but I didn't quite realise that you know from based on who I was and what I was interested in around what the different pathways were actually out there so we set up a um, online platform for it so over the last um, seven years six seven years of, of running that. Um, we've worked with about 200 companies across New Zealand uh, and actually helped them with their attraction and selection uh, of talent, which I call future leaders, emerging talent, um, your, your graduate talent into those, those roles. Um, and alongside that we've done a lot of work um, around supporting what that employability piece looks like. So the likes of First Foundation, um, Outward Bound, um, I helped set up the Tipitoa program around Marion Pacifica Pathway pro um, for uh, graduates, you know, Teach First NZ and others. So we've quite ingrained in it, uh, in the graduate area, and I think what that's done for, for us is it gives us a really strong understanding of not only what employers are wanting um, and what they're expecting, um, but also uh, the student side of it as well, around how we need to best prepare these students for, for the world of work. Um, and that sort of intersection, I think, is that you rightfully said, Mark, before, um, between um, the employability and, and, and how do we build a, a work career a young person, and then how we make sure we balance that with ensuring we can, what I refer to as academic enrichment. So how we can sort of enrich these young people in a way that they can have the best chance of succeeding. Um, in the future. So yeah, I know, I know a bit about grads and I know a bit about what the employers are. So I think today, um, when I sort of finish up, just please just, just hammer me on any of these different areas um, of what, um, what is happening out there in the world of work. But I thought I'd just share some thoughts with you around um, the employability piece in particular. And um, I probably sat and I think it was a room here or, or close to here, uh, probably three or four years ago when there was an international forum hosted. And the key, key purpose of that forum was talking about um, graduate employability. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of global um, leaders that were here. And what I spoke about was um, you know, the purpose of um, tertiary education. And I said, is it around academic enrichment or is it about employability? And sometimes if he's put an employer hat on, I'll sit there and go, well, it's only about employability because I want somebody who can work, work in, walk in the door and start the job tomorrow, and that can just get on with it. Um, which isn't right, because um, there's an onus on them as well. But then there's also on the other side of it is that are we putting um, too much emphasis, um, or are the students putting too much emphasis on ensuring that they are um, top, the best of the best that they can be in terms of their academic profile. And I think... Um, they're not, they're not mutually exclusive, um, they need to be considered very closely together. And I think um, from, from my perspective, you know, where I see um, this tertiary education um, sector not working cohesively is around actually realising that both of those things, if we get both of those parts nailed together, it's actually, you know, the world's your oyster and I think the talent that you'll be producing and getting out there will be um, the top of the pile. Um, it's not one or the other, they, they are absolutely connected. So what I think about how do we try and make, um, how do we try and embrace that um, and be part of the solution rather than part of the problem of actually pushing one area over, over another. So I'm, we do a lot of research um, in stats uh, and we actually build programs for companies now. So I thought I'd just quickly just talk to you about what actually from an employer's perspective around what they're doing uh, in that selection piece. So if between you know, Next Step um, and the university career services teams <coughs> across the universities, they're promoting out what pathways are available, are available for young talent, um, you know, there's, then it gets through to a selection piece. And the key things here for you guys is around here, there's an application process, which what I refer to as a quick cull. So that's the way that they'll cull people when they first come through from applying. There'll generally be culture fit testing, psychometric testing, video interviewing, assessment centres, and then interviewing and schmoozing um, around trying to find whether that person's right for that company or not. Sitting alongside that is something that's become incredibly evident in the last probably 12 months, probably two to three years, maybe more rightly, is around closed processes. 
So we've got companies out there now that are aligning their values around um, unconscious bias. Um, they're, they're running complete blind processes. So the only time that they will actually see that graduate is when they walk into either an assessment centre or an interview. They have no other information about, um, you know, on them around who they are, uh, what their background is, apart from the different tests that they're going through and doing. So then think about that from an academic perspective. How do you prepare a young person um, to ensure that they have the best chance of success when all of those other sort of factors you can't put out there and show from a blind process? So when we come to things like, um, and I'll talk about it in a second, the graduate profile, um, ensuring that we are um, ticking off and, and we're ensuring that each of those um, characteristics and um, attributes in that are actually being delivered is incredibly important because especially in that blind process that's becoming more and more common, it's not just a fad, um, these companies are having to rely on you know, the testing that they're doing um, rather than here look at a full CV and this, all the different benefits that pop out of it. Yep. Yeah, um, morning. My name is Kevin Campbell and I work in the professional development program here in the business school. I just want to pick up something I'm hoping you're going to talk about yep. is laser culture fit testing. Yep. Are you going to expand on that? Yeah, I, I, I will. So I think what what I'm trying to, I can quickly talk about it now, but um, right. what I'm trying to, the culture fit testing piece is something that's um, has been around probably for the last um, probably three or four years. And what, it's, what it is is that when you look at a process, so psychometric testing, okay, so you've got your cognitive testing, so that's the real smarts, okay, so that used to be a really big significant part of um, a selection process. Well, now it's becoming less and less and less, and they'll be doing, say, maybe a 10, 15 minute um, cognitive test. Because they're, you know, in particular for Auckland, where you guys are lucky, <coughs> is that you tend to churn out the best talent anyway. And from an academic point of view, it's expected. You know, if they're an Auckland University graduate, business school graduate, they are generally the best. So I'm looking now around fit. So the culture fit that they're looking at there um, is around, you know, what kind of person are they? Are they going to be able to be a team player with us? Are they going to be able to communicate? Are they going to be able to be, think differently? Are they going to be able to um, really have that integrity and resilience and things like that? So they're all key things that, you know, when you look through your graduate profile, sit there. And they'll ask certain questions. You know, if you're walking into a magazine store and there's, you know, what kind of magazine will you pick up? Or are you the sort of person that will get up in the morning and go for a run? Or flick on the TV to catch, get updated on the news? Or, you know, are you more likely to go and join the social sports team at work uh, or uh, make sure you just get an extra hour? You know, so it, those are the kinds of ways that they test that. There's, it, it's not scientific, which is a bit scary for me, um, but they are, it's just one of a suite of tools that they tend to use. So if I look at those the, the, the graduate profile, and I, and I think about this alongside what employers are wanting, it closely mirrors it. So you think about um, developing specialist skills, critical thinking, problem solving, communication, um, demonstrating uh, integrity and independence and being socially aware, that's how I've sort of paraphrased them. Um, and I put that alongside what the top things graduate um, employers are looking for. Um, Number one is communication skills. Number two is teamwork, ability to be able to, be able to work in a team. Number three is your academic ability. So think about rankings that are sitting there. Four is critical thinking. Five is drive and ambition. And that's a huge one that employers are talking to us about now. You know, what is the drive and ambition of these young ones? What are they wanting to do? Um, problem solving six, social propensity. So basically social awareness. Um, and then eight, which I think is probably my favourite, and I'd probably put it at the top of the list, is common sense. <laughs> so that's what employers are wanting. And then if you marry that against what I, the, my way I paraphrased what the graduate profile piece is, they largely connect. <coughs> and then the academic one isn't something that sits over here. It's, int it's integral. It's connected to it. So having those or learning those pieces together is, in, and is incredibly important. And the onus on a young person um, to be picking up those skills outside of university is changing. And this is something I talked with Mark and Nerissa about. So if I look at you know, the, the most common, the common things that a, um, that a young person has when they're accepted into a graduate <coughs> role outside of academics, number one is part-time work, and it's about 90%. So this is the success chances of getting into a, into a, a full-time graduate role. What does the other, other part of their life look like? 
So about 85, 90% is around um, part-time work. About 60% are involved in some kind of sport or cultural uh, activity. Okay, so you're thinking about back to those attributes again around communication, around teamwork, um, and um, team working um, skills. Third one there is around their personal strengths and resilience. So are they actually you know, resilient young um, people? Those are sort of the top three things that are there. Then there's sort of wider things that, you know, have they been traveling? You know, have they, you know, are they a worldly person? Have they lived away from home? So, you know, those are some of the things that, um, that, are, that are jumping out around what an individual's sort of doing. But some of those things, are what individuals are doing, is being put under quite great strain at the moment because with the academic needs are increasing and increasing. You know, I just think about even over my time, when, you know, my older brother went through university and doing a double major was huge back then. Um, you know, and then when I went through, it was sort of standard that everyone did a double degree. And then it just sort of continues. And, and then you've got, you've got your grade point averages that have, you know, that are really, you know, that basically are, are that selection process for employers that are there. And then the pressure just builds and builds and builds. And then what sort of, at what cost? And the cost has been, you know what, am I involved in a part-time job or work? Am I involved in something extracurricular? Am I out there in the community and volunteering or supporting? That's become at the cost of actually ensuring we get this, um, you know, the academics right. But if you're sitting here and looking at employers, they're spending absolute mega bucks trying to assess the non-academic component um, of someone coming into a job. You know, they're spending huge money. The testing companies, you know, they are spending 10, 20, 30, 40 dollars per test per person. And if you sit there and extrapolate that out, and you're getting 500 or 1,000 applications, you know, it's a business we probably all should be involved in. Um, you know, there's big money that's there. Then they run these huge assessment centres. Why are they doing all this? They're doing it to try and find the right fit. They know the grades average is fine. The degree base is fine, great, got that. But they're spending a huge amount of time, effort and money on this area here. Just think from an institution point of view, if we start to get you know, really demonstrate and show or measure <coughs> that, what that graduate profile looks like. When somebody, I, 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 and I went back through my old emails and I couldn't find who it was, someone was doing a PhD um, um, program here at the university and, and came and spoke to me about five years ago and said, here's the graduate profile, we're going, we're, I'm, I'm reviewing it as part of my PhD project. And I'd never seen a graduate profile before in my life. So then I jumped on and just to see, did we have one of these at Victoria University? Uh, and I did the same thing yesterday as well, just to double check because yours has been briefly updated um, and, it's, and it's a heck of a lot further on than where it was or more simple to understand. But I, you know, I jumped on, and no disrespect to um, Vic, it was, it was pretty woeful when I looked at it. And I thought, how are we holding to, uh, these to account and how are we incorporating these into our academic pathway when they're so integral to a young person you know, getting into a job or actually having a successful career. So, yeah, to, to Nurse and Mark's um, credit coming and speaking to me, it was just like, yeah, hallelujah, yes, I'm all over this, and I think it's incredibly important. And employers will walk in and say, we want, we want kids that are more work-ready. And, you know, and you guys are going, oh, for God's sake, we've got all this stuff to teach them. We've got all of these academic... Um, you know, courses that are there and, um, and, and then we've got to make sure they've got to hit certain levels and we're completely overworked as it is to try and actually get just the academic piece done. Someone else needs to deal with that, so the employers need to deal with that. And the employers are going, no, 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 whatever, no. They're using a university student, and if I put my old accountant hat on, as a risk profile player. They're de-risking themselves by hiring a university student versus hiring a school leader or someone from a polytech or an institute of technology i.e. because you're teaching them to a higher level um, and they're generally their standard of intellect should be at a, at a higher level. So when they're going through a selection process, it's easier to have a university student come through. So I've talked to companies across New Zealand, and I won't name them, but so they shouldn't be hiring university graduates at all. But they do it because they get it's the talent. They might only stay two or two years versus if they'd hired a polytech student when they might have actually stayed five years or ten years, but it's the right kind of fit for their business, but it's de-risking themselves because that person can start, they can learn quickly, um, and they can do the job. But is it going to be what they need longer term? Maybe not. So 
you know, I, I think um, from from your point of view, there's there's a significant opp opportunity, I think, to be able to build those skills better um, into what your pathway is that you're delivering. It's not one or the other; it, it's putting them together. So I'm back. Just, sorry, just a question around yep. equity, um, and I think you know what you're saying. You know, resonates very well with the experience that I've had with um, certainly of my kids going for jobs and things. But what concerns me is the, is the equity issue around the non-academic components and how students from, from disadvantaged families just don't have the capacity yeah. to do those aspects because they've got family responsibilities they yeah. and, and it's, therefore the advantage become more advantaged and the disadvantage more disadvantaged. Yeah, it's a really good point. And I, and I think of, um, you know, I'm involved with, I've been involved with First Foundation, which is the whole purpose of what that scheme is around how we try and get um, underprivileged young people that have that um, first in family at um, tertiary education. And it's no different from work we're doing with Te Patoa around how we can try and help um, get people from universities into a pathway. Um, I'm, pretty much, I'm, I'm fine. Can you hear me alright, everyone? Yeah, so it's fine. Thank you. Um, Answering to your point, it's, around, it's all about how you're packaging, packaging a person up effectively for a role. Now, employers aren't stupid, you know, that the story of somebody who is, has a part-time job, then they're caring for their siblings at home, um, and because they have to bring money through the door um, to help actually you know, help the family live. Um, they might not be involved in sports teams and those kind of things, but they generally will tend to be involved with their local, um, local community or church. But it doesn't matter what it is. It's not a matter if you have to play for a university sports club. It's just around how we can help these young people package up the experiences that they're going through or that they've had, uh, and then how the you know the different characteristics you know that come out of that or attributes that come out of that they can be they can be done in a whole lot of different ways. You know, so I think when somebody's going for a job interview and, and they're going well, the first thing we're looking for is somebody who's got. Um, you know, they've got previous work experience in an area. Well, who the hell has previous work experience in that specific area if they're a university student? Unless they're fortunate to have known somebody who, say, accountant, would go and works part-time with a family accountant. You know, I didn't do any of that kind of stuff. I've got no practical ability whatsoever. And I was on a roof and I was draining. Like, I wouldn't have a clue what I was doing. But what I learned there was showing up on time. It was like working, working hard. It was communicating with people from different um, backgrounds. Um, and it sort of showed me around how that other part of you know, the world actually works. And I think that's one of your characteristics on the graduate profile, is about you know, understanding the real world and understanding you know, what's out there. So I wouldn't think it's a disadvantage at all. I think it's about how we can help that individual tell their story better, and I think that's what we're not doing right. Mm -hmm. Just to pick up on that, yeah, you talked about this notion of graduates being really yeah. but we've also got a push now where We've had some very high profile examples of graduates saying, Are you ready for me? Yeah. Because, to pick up on your equity point, maybe I don't want to go into a culture that's deeply misogynist and sexist yeah. and, and racist. Maybe I don't want to go into a work environment which has no attention to social impact. Yeah. So, I just think you're really emphasising that all the power is sitting with the employers. But I've just been judging the high tech awards and I've seen this generation of young t female tech entrepreneurs coming mm -hmm. through going, we don't, we don't want to go with the PwC, we're going to start our own gig because that culture is not right for us. Look. It doesn't align with our values and I, I'd really love to hear more about that side yeah. of the story. Yeah. And, and, and I think what you're saying, there's been a huge shift in that, that area. Yeah. You know, I think when we started um, our business in 2009, there's no such thing as the word social enterprise. You know, it just didn't exist let alone was there actually degree programs that you could do in entrepreneurship. That was before that as well. Um, and I think um, what the shift that's happened is people have actually realised this generation coming through now in particular is around that balance piece has been drummed into them since day one. You know, that, the ability that they can actually um, learn in a whole lot of different ways and share different experiences and the accessibility to starting something themselves is a lot easier than what it was for the parents' generation. You know, it's completely different. Um, what I'm seeing now from a, a business point of view is that um, there are still those traditional companies, and some have been in the media more recently than others, uh, in that area, where they are being pushed to the end and have to change, and in my mind not changing enough, or that shift isn't big enough. But you're seeing other companies that are basically building entrepreneur 
entrepreneurial um, divisions with inside their companies. And I've seen this, um, you know, Spark's a great example of that. There's a few you know, the innovations hub that's there. I think some of the banks out of Australia, they're completely trying to create an entrepreneurial life for young people inside what you'd think is quite a traditional boring kind of um, industry or, or company. That's in terms of what's happening from the corporate sector. The other thing that's starting to happen too is around this whole values piece. That used to be, you know, what you know, what is our vision for our company and what are our values? It used to be this great little charter that sits somewhere in front of the annual report or whatever it was, but no one really looked at it. And to be, if I'm really honest with you, I'd probably say the graduate profile would be like that. If I'm being really honest, it's this great, this great document that a lot of work's gone into, but it's just been over here. But then now people are being held to account a lot more. Well, you're saying you're this kind of employee, but what the hell are you actually doing? You're not actually acting like this. And that turn, and I think the last, <coughs> time, say, what, 18 months, probably, even 12 to 18 months, with some things that have happened globally and even locally here, people just aren't standing for that anymore. Your other piece that you talked about around the whole people that aren't going for a traditional pathway, say, in university, and instead of going into, and instead of going into, um, uh, you know, entrepreneurial employment or doing something themselves, the characteristics the attributes are as important for that pathway for a young person as it is if they're going to a company. So, um, you know, I don't think that changes the conversation around the importance of having strong academics alongside, you know, strong um, employability uh, attributes. And it's not one or the other, and it's because you're going to meet them in anything you're doing. And I'd say the work that I'm doing since I left um, a real job um, has been much more important for those characteristics than what um, having, you know, being a CA or um, yeah, lawyer as I was. So I can a question here. You talked about how the New Zealand companies attract and select. Yeah. Um, on the other side, um, I was talking to accounting students yesterday and talking about mega trends, talking about how the world of work is changing. And the students said, so what does that mean for us? Because we too, just like what you were saying, are so drilled on joining one of the accounting firms, well maybe that's not where we should be going. What do you say to them? Um, it's, <laughs> it's changed. You know, I think when, when I went through into that pathway, um, they were accounting firms, now they're consulting firms. So they're becoming a heck of a lot more broad of where their um, base, their revenue base is coming from. How you, the, the, the whole industry, accounting specific, is completely changing. Um, so I think, the, you know, I've just, my wife's an accountant too, um, probably one of the best things to come out of my um, career at PwC. Um, <laughs> all above board too. Um, but, um, you know, we've just set her up as a virtual FD at home. So she's picked up half a dozen clients and now she's working um, virtually for these different companies while she's looking after our little one. Now that, and, and to the point from the lady we just talked before, um, you know, though the ability to you know, get fulfilment from, um, from your employment doesn't have to be with a corporate organisation anymore. So I think for, from, from your point of view, how you're teaching these, these students and, then, and showing that it, you don't have to go to there to get to there, there's a whole lot of different ways to get to, a tree, to achieve what your, your goal is now. So um, I'd say if you can find an organisation that fits your values and what you're wanting to be doing, the kinds of work that they're doing, so often these you know, students that I see aren't asking the tough questions of employers around who are your clients, what actually are you doing with those clients, as opposed to where is your office, you know, oh shit, that's a nice building in a nice sort of area, um, you know, and you know, high level, who are those clients, oh we work for uh, Fonterra or we work for uh, Goodman Fielder or whoever else, because they can all pretty much say that in some way, they are connected to these organisations. So I think building awareness about what they can do with their, um, with their, you know, what they've studied is actually probably as important. That's all. So, can, as part of the education process, a quick cut. Oh, sorry, it's probably me being a little bit you know, non-PC. Yeah. Yeah. No, the quick cut they tell when students have got C's and B's. No, 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 no. I think this is a big misconception that's out there. I said fit is everything. Okay, now. So the fit for the company. So you might have somebody that's got a straight A, um, you know, is not what the company is wanting because it doesn't actually fit for them. And I can remember on campus, and I used to come to here, uh, with, you know, with the employer and saying, oh, come work for us. And oh, don't worry about the green future, don't worry, it's fine. And then some people go, oh, yeah, whatever. They're going to need to have an A to get through or whatever it looks like. 
the money that these companies are spending now on trying to understand um, who they, who an individual is outside of their academic transfer. That's after the group. Yeah, it is important. But what they're trying to do then is they're asking particular questions of somebody up front. So if I be really honest, what it used to be like was, um, where have you studied? Because there was an unconscious bias around particular institutions. You know, I studied law at Victoria and I was 10 minutes away from Waikato University. I'll leave that. And then, um, <laughs> but then was it actually, was that, would that have actually changed my ability to be a good lawyer or not? Probably not, but it was a perception piece. So the next thing there used to be around citizenship status. Huge. And employers would just go, it's just too hard to ask it. And that used to be around other New Zealand citizen or permanent resident, and then it got even worse than that. And it was, I'd say, racist. These companies would then go through and say, well, I don't actually, that, that last name doesn't look like a Kiwi last name. Cool. Out. Yeah. I'm being quite honest here. Yeah. Um, all of that stuff is changing, because we did a, we did a piece of research last year, <coughs> which we talked about um, international students. Um, so people that identified themselves as an international student, um, but that were actually New Zealand citizens and permanent residents. And it was about 75, 80%. So no more, and this is what we educate employers, no more can you go and try and do a quick cull based on someone's last name because you're probably going to get it wrong now because they're probably born and bred second or third generation uh, New Zealander. Mm -hmm. So I think of some things that I was going to finish on, um, <coughs> which I might just jump to now, just giving a timing, which was around um, looking at some of those other environmental factors that are out there that, we're, that are challenging us being able to succeed in this area. And one of them for me is around the ever-changing um, demographic of our institutions. Uh, so in terms of, which is actually, how do we embrace that um, from our international student mix with our New Zealand student mix? So if we're saying we want to get much more into around really strong group work, um, project-based work, and then you've got, you know, how does that actually work practically? Uh, where communication, which might not be first languages amongst even your own students that are, that are sitting here in class. The issue probably along with Auckland University in particular is most people start home. You know, so if I'm going to Otago, it's very unlikely that I'm from Dunedin. So how that person or individual is developing, um, you know, just by going somewhere different, um, and so, but a lot of Auckland University students are just from here. How, how does it work? So what, what else do they need to be doing? Um, then I looked around around technology and how, how you're using technology from a teaching perspective. And what is, it's not sort of downsides, but what are the other things you need to think about alongside that. So if we're doing online learning or we're doing um, online tutorials, things like that, how is that actually affecting the, the, uh, the, the person's ability to demonstrate teamwork and develop teamwork skills and communication skills when we're using and harnessing online a lot more. And... Um, <coughs> Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, and then again, what I said earlier on around um, the, you know, the importance around ensuring academic excellence and is that, does that come at the cost uh, of you know, employability skills. Is there any other sort of questions before I just wrap up? No others? No other burning questions? Are you talking about employers? Yes. All, it's every, well, so all, they generally tend to be major employers. So that'll be any sector, so from your engineering firms to your law firms, um, to you know, your Fonterra's, FMCG market, the whole works. That'll be out. So they tend to be people, if you look at New Zealand market, um, you have graduate programs, which really there isn't that many, if you're really honest about it. Then you have graduate roles, which is what I'd say you'd go into, it, say, you know, a Becker, you know, or a um, PwC, or a um, Bell Gully, um, or you have entry level roles that a graduate could do, which tends to be probably 80% of the market here in New Zealand. You know, we are quite unsophisticated in terms of that graduate um, structure by comparison to say the US, UK uh, or Australia. And the vast reason for that is purely we just don't have the numbers and the investment into significant programs when you've only got maybe 10, 15, 20 people versus other countries where they've got hundreds, it's hard to make. And then do you think all those traits you talked about in employees will have to respond to SMEs? Uh, SMEs? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. The biggest issue with SMEs um, is that you've got the person who's doing the hiring, that's the main person doing the work in that company as well, then they're having to manage that staff. And, and, and their issue they find that they have is around, hey, how do they go out and get the people? 
but then secondly, how do they ensure that they um, can actually help develop them when they're trying to do so many other things? Which is why you tend to see them that they, you know, they either go, oh, it's just too hard, I'll find someone who's had them for a year or two, then I'll poach them. So an experienced grad is what I'd probably call those. Um, or they're missing out, and I think actually the latter is probably, you know, there's a huge opportunity there um, that we should be engaging with SME businesses better than we're not doing. That's on us as well as everyone. One last question, anywhere out there? No? I'm, I'm sure there are, but um, if you want to keep it going. Yeah. So, um, <laughs>